how good has this series on uh, the unoffendable heart been? Have you guys learned a lot from this series? It's been amazing. It's been a really transformational experience. So the, and so for those of you who are just jumping in, there's four chambers of your physical heart. And when I wrote this message series, there's four chambers of your spiritual heart. And each week we've been dealing with a different chamber of your heart so that when you get to the conclusion of this message series, you have an unoffendable heart. Now, let me just tell you, Jesus was unoffendable. You, it was impossible to offend Jesus because Jesus knew his mission he knew who called him and he knew that none of those Pharisees and Sadducees started him so they couldn't stop him. And so when you know who called you, come on, I'll just start preaching this message already. When you know whose you are and you know who called you, they didn't start you so they can't stop you. You can say whatever you want. You can't offend me. You can't hurt my feelings because I know the one who called me. So we're gonna really talk about this last and final chamber. It's the chamber of memory, memory. So let's look at Joshua chapter one, verses one through three. Now I'm gonna start preaching right off the jump. I'm not gonna hold back. And if I have to, I'll just crawl through the seats to get your attention, okay? Because I, I, I met a lot of families after our 9 a.m. service here who are still crying because of the confirmation from God. I feel that for many of you, this is gonna be one of the most important sermons you listen to because I believe that many of us are in transition and God is calling us up to something higher. And do, does anybody feel like you might be in a transition? Do you feel like God's calling you up to something higher? Okay, this word is right on time. Joshua chapter one, verse one through three. So verse one says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. Let's just stop right there. Who is this guy, Joshua, getting called up to lead all of Israel? The aide, the guy who sets the chairs up for the event, the front door greeter, the guy who volunteers in V1 Kids every week. How many of you know that when God calls you and promotes you, it doesn't matter who knows you, it doesn't even matter if they like you, but they can't stop what God started. You don't have to be liked by man to be promoted by God. Come on, somebody, help me preach this. Clap your hands if you receive that word. I'm here at St. Anthony's today. <laughs> Thank you, all right. And why? Joshua was an aid. Joshua was called by God. I love just the first verse that you have here in the scriptures because it's a reminder that promotion does not come from man. It comes from God. It, it said, the, the scriptures say promotion doesn't come from the north, south, east, or west. It comes from God. So guess what? You already know the only person you need to know to be promoted. You know Jesus. Some people say, if I change my relationships, I would change my level. No, if you change your relationship to God, he'll change your level. Is this helping anybody? Verse two, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then go and you and all these people get ready. Somebody say, get ready. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give you. Now, I just got back from my second trip to Israel. We are taking a church-wide trip in October. Who's going? Some people, it's gonna be awesome. Now, I've seen the Jordan River twice. This is simply an impossible request by God. To be told, get ready, you're gonna cross the River Jordan is an impossible task. When God calls you to do something, the evidence that you know it's Him is it's impossible for you. If you can do it, you get the credit. But if you can't do it, but God does it through you, he gets the glory. How many of you wanna give glory to God with your life? Come on. You gotta believe for the impossible. They told me that Long Island was the graveyard of churches. We're doing three services with seating there, bought a building in Indiana and New York City's packed every Sunday. And I believe we're getting a building here on Long Island. God specializes in the impossible. If it's impossible, it's a job for Jesus. That's how he gets the glory. We don't get intimidated, we get inspired by the impossible. The world gets intimidated by the impossible because they're the source of their own strength. 
They're the source of their own finances. But we get inspired by the, by the impossible because we say, God, I can't wait to see how you show off this time. Oh, I'm going deep. I'm breaking some chains. He says, go cross the river Jordan into the land that I'm about to give them to the Israelites. And then it says this in verse three, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Now verse six, be strong and courageous. Everybody say courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to them and their ancestors to give them. Now watch, watch. It's not that God can't do it without you. It's that he won't. Some of you are saying, I don't even understand this attack on my life. I haven't even written a book yet. I don't even understand this attack on my life. I haven't even launched the business yet. I don't understand why my life's been so hard. It's a life of insignificance. But the devil knows how to read a seed and he sees what's inside of you and he's going to stop it before it comes out of you. Come on. But see, I got good news for you. Be courageous because if God said it, not even the devil can stop it. See, listen, verse six says, because you will lead these people. He's talking to Joshua. God promised it, but then Joshua carried out the promise. In other words, God could have done it without Joshua, but he made up his mind, I won't do it without Joshua. See, some of you are messed up. Toe up from the flow up. Some of you got more issues. <laughs> than Men's Health Magazine. I understand that you don't have it all together, but God has made up his mind. Yes, I could do it without you, but I won't because my plan was for you from the beginning. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I knit you together. You couldn't have died in that car accident. You couldn't have been taken out by that person who tried to kill you. You had to be here until you fulfill the fullness of your assignment. How many of you believe that? Verse seven, he says it again. How many of you know God has a way of repeating himself? It's not because he's absent-minded, it's because we is. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey. Somebody say obey. All the law. How much of the, the law? All of it. My servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. When you go into New York City and Central Park, those horses have blinders on because what determines their ability to walk that course is by eliminating the visibility of what's left and what's right. God is telling me divinely to tell somebody right now, it's time for you to limit what you see and focus on the vision. Limit your visibility, focus on the vision. Oh, come on, that's good. Limit the visibility. You don't need to see everybody on social media. Maybe you need to unfollow some people and limit your visibility to increase your vision of what God gave you. Sometimes, listen, I'm helping you. That block button is divinely placed by God on every platform. Use it. Because coming into 2023, now watch. God will give you a word first because it comes in the form of prophetic preparation. And then he knows January, February, March, April, he's gonna begin to establish the word that he gave you in November, December. And so what happened in Joshua chapter one is there's a word that's given, but this word is preparation. Be bold, be courageous, do what I told you to do, obey my scriptures, obey the law. Why? Because I'm gonna give you the lamb. Have I not commanded, this is verse nine, be strong and courageous. This is now the third time. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It'd have been nice if your dad went with you, but you got better than that. You got your heavenly father. It would be nice if your spouse went with you, but the Bible says that even if your spouse is an unbeliever, if you are a believer, you become their covering spiritually. Oh, I know I'm speaking to something right now. It'd be nice if your, if your kids went with you. Sometimes you raise them up and they go a different direction. It'd be nice, but the Lord makes a promise in verse nine. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. How many of you know 
that he'll walk with you right into that job. He'll walk with you right past your coworkers. Sometimes he doesn't eliminate the job. He increases your awareness of his presence on that job because you're a light in dark places. And some of you are getting ready to enter that place and say, I'm unoffendable. You used to drag me down, but I'm buoyant now because greater he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I hear your voice, but I choose to listen to his voice. How many of you are gonna choose to listen to the voice of God? There's a difference between seeing and focusing. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Oh, how many note takers do we have? There's a difference, but you, you can't help what you hear, but you can help what you listen to. You can't help what you see, but you can help what you focus on. And come on, this is a word for somebody. And God was dealing with Joshua saying, Joshua, what I'm calling you to do is going to be so hard. It's going to be, it's going to be so hard. It's impossible that you'll have to talk like I tell you to talk. You'll have to listen to what I'm saying because they're going to all have opinions, but their opinions couldn't get them out of the parking lot of the wilderness, but my thoughts are higher than their thoughts. My ways are higher than their ways. And you will do what no generation before you has done. You will go into the promised land. How many of you believe that 2023 you're going into the promised land? Okay. You're slow clapping it in. So I got to make this more real. New York city. I was watching the news the other day. And just a few days ago, the mayor of New York City actually said, we are going to freeze all of our hiring. We're going to scale back our budgets. And he said, what's coming to New York City is an economic tsunami. Fear-based thinking. He said an economic tsunami is coming to New York City. And I got people messaging me, oh, did you see what the mayor said? And I'm like, yeah, I'm celebrating because when faith speaks, fear jumps. And I've got a surfboard called faith. And the bigger tsunami, the bigger the wave that we're going to ride to another level, to a higher height. And what looks like it's impossible to the world, it's not a setback. It's a setup to another level. Does anybody believe that? to my New York campuses. Let the tsunami come because we know how to surf waves by faith. Anytime there's a famine, there's going to be a Joseph sitting on a pile of grain that's big enough for Egypt and Israel. Anytime you hear the taunts of the giant, there's going to be a shepherd boy swinging his sling. There's always somebody that God places in the midst of impossibility to prove whose God's the real God. When the prophets of Baal are cutting themselves, begging for fire to fall, there's always going to be an Elijah pouring water in the moat, saying, make it a little bit harder so I can show you whose God is the real God. We are not intimidated. We are inspired by hard things. I wish somebody would jump up to their feet and give God a five-second praise break and celebrate like you're going to see the impossible become possible in your life. Hallelujah. This is a Joshua generation. Moses is dead, but I see some servants rising up. I see an aid coming. Come on. They may have rejected you. They may have discarded you, but they couldn't cancel what God called. Come on, take your seat. I get canceled every six weeks. It's hard with me being your pastor because the world is okay with you walking into grocery stores and seeing the new age being presented to your kids. The world is okay with your kids doing seances and tarot cards and rituals. The world will agree unanimously that the spiritual realm exists, but then tell us we're weird. So here's the thing. Some of you care about people's opinions. Then those same people wouldn't help you if you needed help. So why are you... Why are you staying in agreement? This is what I'm talking about. The reason why God in chapter one of this, the book of Joshua has to speak the way he did with Joshua is because he was going to be hearing a lot of opinions as he was installed into his next level. And it's time for us to say, God, whatever you say is a truth and everything else is a lie. I will not be judged in heaven by how good of an American I was. I will be judged by whether or not I obeyed this constitution. 
This is the law that supersedes every other law. What this says is what I believe. I don't have my own opinion. This is my opinion because I'm an ambassador. I'm an echo, not a voice. And when you hear me, you should be hearing this. We're living in a crazy time of transition. Somebody say transition. And this is going to be an elevation of people that God was preparing, but we got to deal with the chamber of memory because you have to be unoffendable. Jesus hung on the cross and said, forgive them for they know not what they do. You've got to get to the point where you can actually forgive people who are operating out of spiritual ignorance. They're operating out of their own hurt. Their own, how many of you know hurt people hurt people? And so you've got to understand transition, transition, transition. Let me give you some definitions of courage. Courage is not just the ability to do what scares you, but it's strength in the face of pain and grief. I believe that there's many of you that have been in a grieving season. Joshua was in a grieving season. Moses died. Moses was their leader. He loved Moses. Moses always seemed to be able to hear from God. Now, Moses had a lot of character flaws, but Moses was always a voice and an oracle of God. There was a grieving season that Joshua went through. So, G so God had to repeatedly tell Joshua, be courageous, be bold, because he was trying to end that grieving season. There's many of you that have been grieving the previous seasons, and the Lord's saying, I'm trying to call you out of that grief and that pain. And courage is the strength that causes you to walk out of it. It's the courage to say those days were good, but my best is yet to come. I haven't preached my best sermon. I haven't, I haven't written my biggest check. I have, come on somebody. I haven't, it's, it's, the, my, it's this, I, grief tells you that the past is as good as it's gonna be. But faith and that courage that he's talking about says there's greater things still ahead. Courage is strength in the face of the memories on repeat over and over and over again. There's something crazy about the way that our minds work. Our minds are very powerful things that they're wired in such a way for our survival. And so what happens is if I walked off this stage and as soon as I hit this, this threshold, I went down to the ground and I tested this theory that I could walk on thin air. And every single time I did it, I hit the ground. There's a mechanism in my mind that would say, don't do that again, dummy. You're going to hurt yourself. And it's for our preservation. The problem is there are greater laws than gravity. And so what happens is if you kind of limit yourself in that way, your memories can actually inhibit another level. Let me talk to you about an airplane. Have you ever thought, and I don't know if you're afraid to fly, but our church is named V1 and it's airplane imagery. So I'm sorry. And my wife, every time we take off is like, oh Lord Jesus. And I'm like, Julie, our whole church is airplane imagery. But when you think about an airplane, it's a huge chunk of metal that is literally coming up off the ground, safely goes to 20, 30,000 feet, and then comes back down again, and you're, you survive it. Now, most of us are not crazy enough to ever, ever fathom or think that that is possible because we would say, what goes up must come down. And if you could even get a hunk of metal that far and high up in the air, it would probably come crashing down because we understand gravity. But what we don't understand is thrust and lift. And thrust and lift supersedes the laws of gravity. Okay, because I'm getting ready to preach right now. And so guess what? There is a higher law that supersedes gravity and it makes things that seem impossible to you possible. Thrust and lift says, hey, we will change your perception of gravity. And so here's the thing. The doctor might come in and say, it's impossible. You'll never be healed. You'll never conceive a baby. Come on. They might come in and say, you'll never have a healthy marriage. Your, your spouse will never serve the Lord. But there's a higher law than that law. And as you begin to speak the word of God and declare it over your situation, the impossible becomes possible and some things start coming up off the ground and some things start shifting and changing in your life there's a greater law but you'll never know that unless you speak it the kind of courage in Joshua chapter one was connected to obey all the law in other words let the word be on your lips okay so I got just a little bit more as we close but there's a false courage that I wanted to address because I was thinking about this message in wisdom 
And over all these years of pastoring, I've inspired people to do a lot of things, realizing that maybe it wasn't what God called them to do. And so if you try to be courageous about something God hasn't called you to do, you are going to find that you're severely limited and you're gonna end up, so there's this Galilee-born disciple. His name is Peter. He spent his entire life on the water. He was a fisherman. His, he came from a family of fishermen. And I was just recently at the Sea of Galilee. And when you're at the Galilee, you just become acquainted with what life looks like for somebody that is a fisherman. And Peter, what I love about him is that he was one that took initiative. Isn't it amazing that God can't steer a parked car? You move and God moves. Come on, God can't steer a parked car. It's The Bible is full of people who say, God, I'm gonna move in this direction. You can stop me, but you can't start me. I gotta start me because you started me. Does that make sense? Like you called me, I'm gonna move in this direction. I've had prayers where I've said, God, you gave Moses a burning bush. You gave Mary an angelic visitation and you gave me the Bible. So I'm gonna do what the Bible tells me to do and you can correct my course along the way. But I believe that you started me. So I'm gonna start with you starting me. And so what happens is what I love about Peter is that he had courage, but it was courage in the wrong direction. So he basically risks his life and he's, and they're coming to take Jesus away for the, you know, to, to ba basically crucify him. And he takes out his sword and he was like, how you like me now? That's what he said in the Hebrew. <laughs> Roughly translated, how you like me now? I want to be a gangster for Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like New Testament Christianity is boring. I want a sword. I look at the Old Testament where they get to run into battle and slaughter all their enemies. I'm like, man, Lord, I want to be an old covenant Christian. <laughs> Come on, somebody's like, that's weird. <laughs> so Peter takes out his sword. He cuts off this centurion soldier's ear. And Jesus basically, now watch, he says, you all know the words, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But it comes with a deeper meaning. I want to ask at all of the campuses that the worship team comes up, so he says, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Now, let me unpack that a little bit deeper. If, if Peter, if you're the source, then you are the supply. Peter, if you plan it, then you are the provision. Peter, if you execute it, then you are the protection. See, in other words, whatever is born in the natural realm suffers natural consequences. Peter, if you have to fund it, you'll always have to fund it. Peter, if you're the smartest person, you'll always be the smartest person. Peter, if you're your own protection, you're always going to be looking over your shoulder. But see, there's another way to operate and it's getting your life in alignment with God's will because when that happens, God says, if I initiate it, then no man can stop it. If I called you to it, you won't have to look over your shoulder because surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. If I've called you to it, I've called you through the other side. If I told you to cross the River Jordan, then you will cross it. You might not understand how. You might not have a plan, but I didn't give you a plan. I gave you a person. I gave you me. I gave you intimacy. I gave you a prayer language. I gave you the tongues of angels and the tongues of men. And this generation is obsessed with strategy, but I want to meet the strategist that set the moon and the stars and then set the sun in motion. This generation is saying, give me a plan. I don't want a plan. I want Jesus. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to be running looking for a plan. I'm going to be running saying, where is my Jesus? And when you read the Bible, it's not God given the strategy. He says, be courageous, be bold. I've given you my presence. Wherever you go, I'll go with you. What's more important than a plan is presence. I said, what's more important than a plan is presence. You can have the best plan, but if I don't have the presence with God, I won't take another step. You can have the best strategy for 2023, but if I don't, if God doesn't go with me, I'm not going. Oh, I've walked without God. I'll never do that again. 
Matthew chapter 14, you have another picture with this Galilean disciple, Peter. It says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and they said, oh, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. <laughs> There's a lot of Christians that if you saw Jesus, because you lack intimacy with him, you would recognize him as a ghost before your savior. See, God wants you in this next season to pray like you've never prayed before, to get into the word like you've never gotten before. I'm telling you, when the world says economic tsunami in New York City, you better, you better learn how to surf. You better learn how to be a water walker. And see what happened was Jesus says, immediately take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. But look at the word, take what? Take courage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same Word that came to Joshua was actually Jesus in the story I read to you in Joshua chapter one. Isn't that mind blowing? And now Jesus is speaking again, take courage, but he's saying it to another disciple. And he's saying, don't be afraid. In verse 20, it says, Lord, if it's you, Peter, tell me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come. Now here's the thing about memory. Would you just stand to your feet across every campus? Here's the thing about memory. Every single time Peter interacted with the water, which would have been from birth, a young age. He came from a lineage of fishermen. You never walk the water. There was a contradiction, walk on the water, because it's, it's scientifically impossible. Sees many of you are saying every single time I've tried, I've failed. Every single time I've just seen my spouse get farther and farther away from the Lord. I've been in a single season, but I've always gone back to lust and perversion. I've tried to budget my money, but I always end up spending out of this comfort that I need in my life. Pastor Mike, I keep going back and I feel like I'm in a cycle. Can I just tell you that chamber of memory needs to be healed right now? There's a lifetime of memories that'll say, Pastor, when I was at the last church, I was so hopeful that that church was going to be the right church for me, but they manipulated me. They controlled me. Pastor Mike, I just don't, I want to believe it's going to be different, but I don't know if I can walk on water. Pastor Mike, I went to the last marriage conference and renewed my vows, and I feel like we need to renew them again. Pastor Mike, I lost weight and gained weight, lost weight and gained Anyway, but I'm here to tell you, come walk on the water. Let the Lord heal the chamber of memories. You did something without him. Now do it with him and see what happens. You tried it without him. You talked to your girlfriends about it. Now talk to God about it. You posted about it. Now pray about it. Bring him in deeper. Stop looking for a plan and a strategy and say, God, if I have your presence, I will walk on this water our firstborn was Bella and man it seemed easy got my wife pregnant on birth control praise God the power of Jesus <laughs> and then nine months later you know we had Bella and praise God and then and then a couple years later maybe about it two years later we're living in Indiana and we go to the fanciest Italian restaurant they have in Indiana. It's called Olive Garden. <laughs> That's a true story. You want to go somewhere fancy? Let's go to Olive Garden. Real Ita Italian. And we're, we're in Olive Garden and I ordered a sparkling water with a lemon. And all of a sudden they bring the tray out and there's a bottle on the tray and I'm like, that's weird. They're serving bottles at Olive Garden because I'm an idiot. And Julie turns to me and she's smiling. She's like, Mike, we're having another baby. And I, I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. I'm so excited. But then we encountered a miscarriage. Then a couple years later, all of a sudden, Julie comes to me again, Mike, I'm pregnant. Oh man. Now this time's different because this chamber of memory was like, yeah, but what about last time? 
See, it's a 50-50. I mean, I had a situation where Bella came out healthy and whole, and then all of a sudden now we had a miscarriage. Now it's the third time. What's going to happen? Well, that pregnancy actually went longer to the point where when that baby died, Julie had to have a surgery to remove that baby's body from her body. And there's two children that we have yet to meet on the other side. So imagine the offense that I felt even before God. Because at this time, I had been through years of marriage counseling. I'm the first one in the church and the last one out of the church. I don't just give 10% to the storehouse. I give 20% to the local church. I've, so, I've done everything I could to just be faithful to God. I pray, I read my Bible, I do all the things that good Christians do. How could this, how could this be happening to me? See that chamber of memory in my heart. It had been diseased. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. God, I believe that you are going to give me a family. We were going through heart sickness. And then all of a sudden, we actually moved out here to New York, pursuing this dream, sold our house, cashed out my retirement, everything so we could do what we're doing right now. And all of a sudden, we get here and Julie goes, Mike, I'm afraid to tell anybody, but I'm pregnant because I don't know what's going to happen. But I will tell you this. I thought about Joshua chapter one. It says, be courageous, be courageous. It doesn't say be offended. It, it says be courageous. In other words, just trust in God's ultimate sovereign plan and God's ultimate sovereign will. And it says, obey the law of Moses. So I did something during that pregnancy that I didn't do the other two pregnancies. I printed out God's word and I said, God, I'm going to remind you what you said. I'm going to remind you of your word. I'm going to remind you, you are not a God to lie neither to repent to man. If you said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I pointed my finger at my, at my wife's womb, and I say, you will live and not die, and you will declare the works of God in the land of the living. I begin to speak life over her womb. I begin to say, God, I will not be offended because we had two miscarriages. I will be an expectation that greater is yet to come. You're still a healer, and I will tell you what? Nine months later, with a full head of black hair, Everly came into the world crying and hasn't stopped crying since. Praise God. Hallelujah. Be courageous. This time is different. It's different with you. It's different in your marriage. It's different with your children. I said 2023. This time is different. Say it with me. This time is. Come on. This time is. This time is. Man, I feel a breakthrough. I got, you, got, you got 30 seconds for one more revelation? It's like I can hear the other campuses shouting with us in the spirit. I get footage every week of the campuses worshiping and throwing down, and I'm so glad that we're one house, many rooms. So I was studying, and when the ancient Israelites read books of the Torah, when they would finish reading a book of the Torah, and they would transition into reading the next book of the Torah, they would say this phrase, Chazek Benadzik. And I'm butchering the Hebrew. But as they would say that, it was a phrase that meant be strong. It was a phrase that meant hold fast and let us strengthen one another because we're transitioning out of this book into the next book. And they would say this phrase in Hebrew, be strong, hold fast, and let us strengthen one another. And it was a tradition that they had between books of the Torah. And I was thinking about how Moses died and how God shows up to Joshua and says, be strong, hold fast, let us strengthen one another. And it was almost as if as an ancient Israelite, Joshua would have been saying, there is a new book that's getting ready to be written. The old has passed. I read what 
what God did in Moses' life, but it's about time to see what God will do in my life. And somebody needs to hear those words. Be bold, come on, hold fast, be strong, and let us strengthen one another because you read about what God did in Scripture, but you're about to live what God's gonna do through your life. There's a new book being written with your last name as the title of the book. It's a new legacy. It's a new dynasty. It's a new day. The old has passed. Behold, all things have become new. You're going into the next season unoffendable. You're going into the next season saying, hey, you used to bother me, but you don't bother me anymore because he healed me and restored my mind and broke off every lie. And I know the truth. And I have an unoffendable heart like Jesus who said, you can kill me, but three days later, I'll still be walking because there's resurrection power if God called you to it. So you'll tell somebody, say whatever you want to say, but I know there's resurrection power behind what I'm walking into. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Let's have our prayer team up front at all three campuses. If you're at a global revival home, jump up into the Zoom right now because we have people who want to pray for you in the Zoom right now. I'm going to count to three in a few moments, and we're just going to begin to sing this song again across all of our locations. I know I went a little bit long, but how many of you are okay with that? Come on, you used to stay at the club all night long. You could stay at church a little bit longer. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Getting home at 4 a.m. Come on, let's do that for Jesus. Welcome, welcome to the other side. But I'm about to count to three and I wanna connect some action to this. And I know that we have limited, limited space at all of our locations at the altars, but I want you to connect action if you need to. If you wanna stay in your seat, that's fine. But I just wanted to make a moment as we prepare to end the Unoffendable Heart series where you say, God, I'm not offended at you, you're good. The devil came to kill, steal, and destroy, but you sent your son to give life and life more abundantly. And there needs to be something where you just say, God, this is it, finish this work before I cross over to the other side. And at every campus, if you need to come up front to receive prayer, I'm gonna ask that you come up. Are you ready? One, Holy Spirit, deal with their hearts. I thank you, God, that you're speaking and moving and that you are canceling every assignment of the enemy. Two, I thank you, Father, right now that they're stepping into the truth, that they are stepping into this next season. Three, right now, if you need to come up front, come up front at every campus. Everybody else, let's just lift our hands in worship as we come to a conclusion this Sunday. Come on, sing it.